Hi, welcome to Zestology, the podcast all about energy, vitality and motivation. It's a windy day down by the river where I'm recording this podcast in London. And I am excited about today's podcast, going to be honest. I'm a big fan of Chris Ryan's podcast and his books as well. And it was all I could do not to be a massively overkeen fanboy when I interviewed him very recently. Um, first read his book Sex at Dawn, then got really into his podcast, been listening to his podcast for a few years. I've mentioned it a few times on this podcast and also uh, on my mailing list as well. And he's one of the best out there. He's very, very good at what he does. What does he do? Um, I would say he's like the best lecturer you've never had in sociology, anthropology, history and sexuality. And his first book, uh, Sex at Dawn was massively popular. His new book is Civilized to Death. I love his stories and thoughts about everything from traveling in India to polyamorous relationships to lots more, really. And after being the person that wrote the book that so many people turn to about sexuality, he's now written Civilized to Death, which has just been released. It's an important and I'd probably say intense read as well. Um, As he says in the book, our most urgent dreams may simply reflect the world as it was before we fell asleep. And the gist of the book is all about how civilization hasn't really helped us as humans. So what is the way forward? How can we seek future guidance in our past? And should we start looking backward to find our way into a better future? Well, we'll deal with all that and lots more in this podcast. I'd say... Yeah, it's a, a podcast of two halves, really. The first part of the podcast kind of looks at civilization and what has happened to us as primates because of civilization. And then in the second part of the podcast, I say to Chris, that, you know, I, I know the message is fairly bleak, but I want some bright siding. What can we do? And um, he definitely comes up with them. I, I mean, I felt really inspired just recording this podcast so I I hope you feel that there are some inspiring thoughts at the end of this one as well Um, it's definitely one of my faves Chris Ryan I would recommend you check out his podcast Tangentially Speaking and here he is on Zestology After being the person who wrote the kind of the book that so many people like to turn to about sexuality. What made you decide this time to write not about sexuality, but civilization? Well, you know, sexuality and civilization are both just part of human existence. And and that's really what I'm interested in is, you know, my whole life, as you know, from listening to the podcast has been about trying to distinguish what is human you know, universally human from what is cultural uh, and then what is personal. So I feel like those are sort of the three realms of human experience. And uh, I think we tend to confuse them. So many of us think that our personal preferences are human, right? We we tend to uh, extrapolate and, and project our personal experiences out into the world. So, um, yeah, civilization is one of those things that's uh, only existed for the last 10,000 years at the most. And uh, that's a very small sliver of human existence. We've been around as anatomically modern humans for uh, about 300,000 years uh, as the latest estimate. And so 10,000 years is a fraction of that, about 3% of that. Um, So in order to understand what a human being is, it's important to look back at our prehistoric ancestors and and what their experience was. So we did that with sexuality, with sex at dawn. And then in this book, I wanted to expand that and talk about other realms of existence because the conflict between the animal that we've evolved to be and the world that we find ourselves inhabiting, those points of conflict produce trauma whether physiological trauma because you know we move in the wrong ways or we eat the wrong foods or um you know in your specialization our our workouts and our, our our sort of energy flow is wrong um or emotionally because we 
aren't uh, we don't have a sense of community that we need or we don't spend time with uh, enough people with whom we have truly intimate loving relationships all these different areas uh, all these points of conflict produce unhappiness and illness and trauma in our lives so I, I'm interested in that whether it's sexuality or diet or sleep or how we raise children or how we die or whatever it is mm. And it's, it's, I mean, it's interesting because I think the themes that come up so often on this podcast and listening to your podcast as well are kind of, well, you know, things that kind of take us back to a bit more of a primal state tend to suit us quite well, whether it's the way that we have our relationships or our communities um, or the way that we kind of interact with each other. But one of the questions that you ask, I think, quite near the start of the book is, um, how would a time traveller from the prehistoric past assess the modern world? And I think in some ways you could say, well, it's a bit shallow, but in some ways you could say, wow, you know, we've got all this technology around us. We've got iPhones. <laughs> um, so kind of what, what is your conclusion about how a time traveler from the prehistoric past would assess the way we live now with all the fairly obvious benefits such as uh, central heating and water supply and antibiotics? Well, the benefits are obvious to us um, because that's the world that we were raised in. So um, I think that it's an intellectual mistake that we tend to make uh, to um, look at our world and the beneficial aspects of our world and ignore the costs of those benefits or just we just don't see them because we have we weren't there when the costs were paid right um so it's very uh tempting to to say oh you know we're so lucky we have antibiotics without understanding that the diseases that those antibiotics protect us from are almost entirely the result of civilization so yeah. You know, if we're looking at influenza or smallpox or cholera or malaria or um, uh, tuberculosis, like you name it, all the greatest killers of humanity in terms of uh, contagious diseases resulted from civilization. They didn't exist for our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Um, they either jumped over from domesticated animals, cattle, pigs, chickens, etc. So these are pathogens that jumped over from those animals into humans when we started living in close quarters with domesticated animals, which of course hunter-gatherers don't do. Um, and they are also resultant from living in uh, highly uh, uh, packed, uh, high population density, settled villages. So they can, once a disease does jump into the human population, it can spread really quickly because we're packed in so tightly together. And thirdly, because we're living in our own sewage for the first time in these uh, settlements, you know, until very recently. So we're talking about thousands of years where people were, um, you know, human and animal waste was just all over the place. And um, so that's where you get your cholera and your other uh, diseases of sanitation. So it, it's kind of, it seems to make a lot of sense to say, thank God for vaccinations. But when you really understand the way human life was before civilization, you realize that that's like saying, thank God for airbags and seatbelts. Our ancestors all must have died in auto accidents. You know, there were no cars. So it doesn't really make sense um, to be praising these late uh, recent solutions to problems that were actually created by civilization mm. and and you know that's it's not just a question of vaccines you could expand this discussion to medicine in general so many of the things that modern medicine um, is adequate at uh, addressing are results of civilization heart disease, diabetes, circulatory problems, stroke, um, dental uh, problems, uh, cavities and impacted wisdom teeth and all, these are all results of civilization. They're all results of our diminished nutrition, um, our lack of exercise, uh, 
These are all diseases of civilization that then civilization turns around and says, you should congratulate us for these partial fixes to problems that we've actually caused. It makes no right. sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I know Civilized to Death has been quite a long time in the making since your last book came out. And um, and I think you said it kind of start to finish about five years, wasn't it, this book? Well, yeah. I mean, it's so hard to, to measure these things. I can tell you that I signed the contract to write the book probably eight years ago. And <laughs> so my, the first <laughs> deadline I blew through was probably seven years ago. Um, yeah, I... I uh, I walk the talk in the sense that I, I have the work ethic of a hunter-gatherer, which is <laughs> not very disciplined. Um, you know, people think hunter-gatherers were living on the verge of starvation and, and you know, just a constant struggle to survive and that, that whole, what I call the neo-Hobbesian narrative. Um, in fact, hunter-gatherers rarely work more than 20 hours a week. And the things that they're doing that we're referring to as work are things that we tend to refer to as vacation time. They're hunting, they're um, fishing, they're, you know, walking around in, in the woods gathering berries. They're, they're basically picnicking. Um, so, yeah, if, if I say I have the work ethic of a hunter-gatherer, that means it takes me a long time to get anything done. Yeah. I mean, well, that's what I was thinking, actually, because, you know, I mean, I've always rather envied your... Uh, hunter gatherer work ethic and that's not the same as me at all but i wonder if you know having spent so long dwelling on all these issues of civilization whether you've actually kind of found it quite depressing might, might have been quite a downer on that on all that free time that you normally spend enjoying life and you know salmon fishing in alaska or whatever it might be uh well yes it sometimes is um partly because of the subject matter uh which is quite dire in the sense that my conclusion is that civilization is probably the greatest mistake any species has ever made. And, um, you know, every civilization that's ever existed has ended in collapse. Mm. Uh, there's a great book called uh, A Brief History of Progress by Ronald Wright. Yeah, Canadian I've read historian. that one, actually. I think on your, oh, rec you? on your recommendation, it's very good, isn't it? Yeah, 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 I recommend it all the time. And he goes through this sort of life cycle of civilizations and he shows how, you know, from Mesopotamia to Easter Island to the Mayans to, you know, you name it, um, civilizations seem to have a, a natural life cycle. And they end in collapse, disaster, uh, they destroy the ecosystem. Um, so that, yeah, it can be, it's, it's not a happy story. <laughs> but on the other hand, I was very gratified when I came across uh, the information about uh, disaster sociology, uh, which are people who spend their lives studying human behavior in disasters. And whether, you know, tsunamis or, or war or... Um, tornadoes, hurricanes, whatever it is, what, whatever the, the disaster is that comes in and wipes out the, um, the state structure, the authoritarian structures that keep everybody in check and make sure everyone follows the rules, all that. Once, you, once those things collapse and are taken away, we would expect, based upon the propaganda we've all heard our entire lives about uh, you know, how we're, man is a wolf to man and, and all this kind of stuff and how we're basically just uh, chimpanzees held at check by the, the state. Um, when the state falls away, people don't rape and pillage. In fact, what people do is help one another. And um, there's this amazing quote from the man who founded disaster sociology and spent his entire life uh, working in this area. And toward the end of his life, he said, what I've learned is that the true disaster is daily life. People who live through disasters remember those years as the best time in their lives hmm. because they weren't isolated. They had a sense of meaning. They had a sense of community. They were helping one another. This is what we're born to do. This is the human design. And in fact, the modern world 
is in conflict with that design. So maybe it's not such a terrible thing. I, a lot of people are suffering already because of climate change and refugee uh, disasters all over the world. So I don't mean to minimize the suffering of people, but the silver lining in all this for me is that maybe it's not such a bad thing to have collapse because the people who survive it will actually probably live better than they're living right now. Mm. Um, have you it's hard to call that it's hard to call <laughs> that optimistic, but that's yeah. all I got. No, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of chuckling to myself because I imagine that you used to be the person that everyone wanted to sit next to at a dinner party, the author of Sex at Dawn. And now you're talking about, you know, catching cholera from pigs and <laughs> that kind of thing. Exactly. That's a good point. Nobody wants to sit next to me anymore. Um, have you heard of Andrew McAfee? Um, I I see the the McAfee antivirus guy. No, he's an author, and oh. he's. I've actually just been listening. The, the way I heard about him was uh, Sam Harris is interviewing him uh, fairly recently oh. on his podcast, and he, his argument is that things are getting better with technology, not worse. Because he says, for example, um, you used to need a camera, a GPS unit, a landline telephone, an answer machine, a tape recorder, and now you just have a smartphone. And he says that um, passenger cars are getting lighter, so they make us, they don't make them cheaper to produce. And he's saying even though there'll be more people in the future, um, they will use fewer natural resources. And he's got a very upbeat message. Um, what, what do you kind of think of some of those arguments around technology? You know, I, I, I'm frustrated by those arguments because I've been hearing them my whole life. I'm 57 years old, and for my whole life, I've been hearing how we're just around the corner from free energy and a cure to cancer and supersonic flight and space colonies and jetpacks and the rest of it. And we never seem to quite get there. Um, I think that what is happening is that people want to hear that message. It's a very gratifying message. It makes people want to sit next to you at the dinner party. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you sort of try to look at it objectively, or at least, you know, my version of objectively, which admittedly is subjective. Um, but when I try to step back and say, let's, in order to understand whether things are getting better, right? A very sort of vague phrase. We need to first define our terms. What does better mean? What are we really measuring here? Uh, I think the only thing that we really should be measuring is quality of life for the average human being. Uh, and when you say, okay, cars are lighter, or you used to need a camera and a you know, and film and um, uh, tape recorder and a GPS unit and all that. And now we have a phone. My response to that is, okay, but is life better for the average person? It's fine to say that there have been these technological developments, but is life better or not? That's the question. Uh, you can always point to technological developments. It, technology has been developing for 100,000 years since the first bow and arrow. But has life gotten better? So how do we judge if life is getting better? One way is to say, when people see the two different ways of living, which do they choose? History is full of examples of uh, colonialists, American and, and uh, North American colonies, being kidnapped by the Indians and then rescued by the white people years later. And what do they do? They run away to live with the Indians. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are hundreds, thousands of documented cases of white people living in so-called civilized societies who've gone native. There were laws passed in the American colonies to make it illegal to run away to live with the Indians. There's not a single case that I know of of an Indian freely choosing to go and live with the colonialists. Um, so I talk about some of those examples. That's one way to to measure people who have a choice. What do they choose? Indians never choose to come and live with us. We force them to. So that's one thing. Another thing to look at is if life is getting better, why are suicide rates going up? Why is depression 
affecting 300 million people. I'm talking about serious clinical depression. The World Health Organization just recently published a report saying it's affecting 300 million people in the world. Mm. Why are a third of American children going to bed hungry at night, undernourished in the richest country that's ever existed? This is not progress. And, it, and the, the, the advances, you know, I've got the iPhone 12 and I've got this and I've got that gadget. I've got all these things. Is my life better or is my life worse? Do I have more people in my life who, who I trust, who I can confide in? 25% of Americans live alone right now. That's the highest rate of human beings that's ever lived alone in the history of our species. That's not good. These people don't want to be living alone by and large. So social isolation is a massive problem. Uh, imprisonment. The United States has the highest prison rates in, in the world, in the industrialized world. That's not progress. So, you know, it, it's, it reminds me of talking about, uh, you know, GDP as a measure of wealth. Yeah. <laughs> and you say, well, okay, the United States has massive GDP, but it's also got the highest homeless population anywhere in the industrialized world. So clearly, that's not the right way to measure these things. Um, you know, I lived in Spain for years, and I, I always sort of laugh when they talk about how American unemployment rate is much lower than the Spanish unemployment rate. Well, they're measuring it differently. In America, they don't count people who've given up and stopped looking for jobs. So they're only looking at people who are actively trying to get jobs. So they say the American unemployment rate is 5%, and in Spain it's 20%. Yeah, but in Spain they're counting the people who, who aren't even looking for jobs. So it's, they're measuring two totally different things, and to try to compare them and say the American system is better is, is absolutely absurd. So I feel like that's what's going on with people who are saying – you know, life is getting better because now my phone does all these things and before I needed a camera. Well, I traveled, my first trip to Asia was in the late 80s. There was no internet. Um, you know, I carried a camera. I carried a recorder. I had a shortwave radio. And I can tell you that that trip was so much richer in very important ways precisely because I didn't have that instantaneous contact with yeah. the West. I was a month away. I had to write a letter. It took a month to get to my girlfriend in New York and then a month for her to, her letter to get back to me. I'm not saying that that was wonderful, and I'm certainly not saying that medical advances don't save lives and so on, but there's a cost to these things. Now you take a trip to India and you're texting with your mother back home, telling her you know to check the mail and do it's it's changes life and technological development is not necessarily uh to a uh, beneficial for human beings and i would refer you to um uh what's his name he was an ethicist at google uh technology ethicist oh, is it Trist tristan harris tristan harris yeah. exactly yeah so he makes the point that technology is not a neutral tool that can just as easily be used for good as bad. His point is that no, technology is designed with nefarious purposes. Technology is designed to suck up your attention, uh, to, to be addictive. There are all these, you know, the little light that comes up when you've got messages and the lag time when you're, you're scrolling. All these things are designed by psychologists and technologists who understand how to hold your attention and pull your life into this. So it's technology, this iPhone that, that you're, you were talking about, this gentleman um, holds up as a great advance, an example of human progress, is actually hurting people. It's making kids feel socially isolated and depressed. It's making them feel like everybody else is having a better life than they are. It's creating lots of anxiety and awkwardness. People don't know how to deal with each other. They're not sleeping well because they're looking at these screens in the middle of the night. All sorts of things are happening uh, as a result of these technological developments that are extremely negative. But that guy's not talking about this. Sam Harris isn't asking questions about this because we all want to believe that life is great and getting better. It's a very self-congratulatory instinct that we have, but it's mm -hmm. misplaced and it's inaccurate.
Yeah, I, I lived in uh, Italy in the early 90s, pre-internet 90s, and uh, I think I went days at a time without even hearing the English language, which meant that I learned Italian really quickly. Um, but you couldn't do that now because it, whatever language you're in, you'd go somewhere and you'd check the Wi-Fi at some point, wouldn't you? And, you know, check your messages or something in your own language. So, um, yeah. so certainly... Uh, immersing yourself in another culture or just in the moment is harder now. Um, I know that you try not to give advice on your podcast, but you do actually have quite a lot of people who listen to you for kind of guidance. Um, and it occurs to me that at this stage in the podcast, some people might be saying, okay, well, in certain different areas you've mentioned, like perhaps kind of community and, and relationships um, or kind of materialism, um, I can recognize the problem what can I do about it on a personal level or the global level? Um, I have, I'm reading your book at the moment, but I have skipped to the end and, and read the last chapter. But what's, I mean, just kind of outline your conclusion on uh, where we are in terms of civilization and what we can do about it. Well, the conclusion I, that I came to is that we're not going to go back where I'm not an anarchist calling for a return to a, you know, a hunter gatherer lifestyle. I think that's totally unrealistic and, um, and I wouldn't want to do it. Honestly. Uh, I think that the middle path is, is to acknowledge that a lot of what we've learned, um, over the last few thousand years is very useful and, um, could help us we could leverage it to create uh, something approaching a paradise on earth um, for example passive energy um, generation uh, solar panels and geothermal energy and um, harnessing wind en- energy birth control i think is a very overlooked technology that can be used to intentionally and uh um, you know, non-coercively reduce global population. We, we seem to be operating under the assumption that eternal, endless growth is necessary um, for our species to survive. And it's, it's absurd. It's quite the opposite. Uh, we would survive far better, have much better quality of life and a much more stable environment if there were 500 million of us rather than 7 billion. Uh, And we could achieve that intentionally if we wanted to. If we found a way to um, sort of harness good ideas and uh, found a way to to, uh, choose leaders who actually were not motivated by ego but were motivated by uh, a sense of benevolence toward the the rest of us, which is what hunter-gatherers do. I think uh, universal basic income uh, combined with incentives to not have children so that people don't need to have children in order to ensure their old age um, could quite rapidly reduce global population to levels that would be beneficial for everyone who's alive. And, you know, the people who aren't born, there's no loss to not being born, right? There's this weird sort of illogical um, cognitive trick going on where it, it, people think it would be a tragedy uh, for this, these people not to be born. But if you're not born, it doesn't matter to you. So I'm not talking about euthanasia or forced sterilizations or anything like that. I'm just saying that uh, if people were economically secure, as we've already seen when people are economically secure, they have fewer children. Um, so anyway, I think basically what I would like to see happen is that we acknowledge that we, as a species, live in an artificial environment that we create. Every day we create it. And we don't live in the natural world. The natural world doesn't really exist anymore. Everything is affected by us on one level or another. So we can become intentional about this. We can recognize our impact on the world and on each other and we can design a world um, with more thought and more understanding for what kind of animal we are so to boil it down we're going to live in a zoo do we want to live in the calcutta zoo or do we want to live in the san diego zoo Hmm. that's the choice Uh, 
Uh, do we want to live in cages and cubicles and fluorescent lighting and uh, just the bare necessities as so many people are right now? Um, or do we want to design an artificial environment that's a replication of the natural environment. So we can do this in our own lives, largely. If um, if you have the opportunity to live close to friends so that you can share resources, you can share cars, you can um, take care of each other's kids, you can um, you know give each other a ride to work or to the airport, even small changes like that. Um, taking care of one another and trying to build your community of people, not just family, but people that you love, who love you, that is an important first step uh, toward redesigning our lives in a way that is more congruent with our nature. So um, that's, that's community. And you mentioned in the book, and I've heard you talk many times about the effect that civilization has had on relationships in fact, there's a bit in the, or oh, I think I might have heard you talk before about uh, Kellogg. The, I think it's the brother of the bloke who invented Kellogg's cornflakes, who had extraordinary views about sexuality and relationships that somehow managed to become quite widespread. Um, perhaps you could just tell us a bit about that, it's half because it's very entertaining, but then also about, about kind of in relation to what you're talking about in terms of community, what about our kind of interpersonal relationships, especially like with a significant other? Um, yeah, John, John Harvey Kellogg, I think was his name, uh, was the brother of the Kellogg cornflakes magnate. Um, he was a so-called um, sexuality and relationship expert who believed in this is in the late 1800s. Um, he believed that masturbation and many people believe this masturbation was the greatest evil facing humanity. Uh, he believed that it um, rotted the, the nervous system, uh, resulting in blindness, insanity, all, all sorts of horrible maladies. Um, and so he took it as his life's work to stamp out masturbation. And <laughs> what a what a life's purpose! <laughs> yeah, yeah, and all you know. Interestingly, he also was very proud of the fact that he'd been married for, I think 20 some years and had never had sex with his wife. Um, he thought that was wonderful. And yet he didn't mention that he had, um, young men, uh, administer an enema to him every morning, that that was part of his morning r routine. So there were clearly interesting things going on in his mind. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as often happens with these so-called, you know, these people who, who call to stamp out homosexuality, well, often they're snorting coke off a, you know, a, a somebody's ass. It's they're, the hypocrisy fuels these campaigns often. Mm. Um, in any case, Kellogg uh, advocated things like sewing boys' foreskins closed oh, wow. with silver sutures so that when they got an erection it would be excruciatingly painful and that would teach them not to masturbate or if a little girl was touching herself inappropriately he recommended in his best-selling books by the way these were national bestsellers in america he advocated um holding her down and pouring acid on her clitoris so th this was a monster this was a horrible twisted sick man who was considered to be uh, an expert on how to raise children mm. in the United States. So, um, you know, as far as relationships go and um, sexuality and family dynamics and all that, in Civilized to Death, I talk a fair bit about the way hunter-gatherers raise children and how they sort of... Uh, how they see children not as partial humans or incomplete human beings. They see them as autonomous human beings with their own uh, capacity to make decisions. And, um, you know, normally if they want to do something, it means they're ready to do something. So there's a lot of autonomy uh, granted to or, or recognized in hunter-gatherer children that um, – when you understand that, you see how much we infantilize children, literally infantilize them. Uh, adolescence is not uh, 
a stage that's even really understood in hunter-gatherer societies. You, you go from being a child to a participating adult in the community. There's no long period where you're in between as there is in our societies. Um, and as far as sexuality goes, you know, and Kellogg and, and all that stuff is there, the role of shame in Western society is, I think, underappreciated. And, uh, I think it fuels so many of the problems that we have ranging from, you know, people, uh, STDs that people contract because they're afraid and ashamed to talk about sexuality. They're having sex with people that they're afraid to talk to about sex. Um, and, you know, we shame children to the point where uh, they're, they're ashamed to walk into a drugstore and buy condoms. Uh, and they shouldn't even have to go to a drugstore. They should be available in schools. I talk in Civilized to Death about the differences between, for example, the Dutch educational system with sexuality and the American system. Uh, the Dutch system being far more tolerant and open and relaxed. And, of course, their rates of teen pregnancy and STD transmission are a fraction of what they are in the United States. And the places in the United States with the highest rates of um, sexually transmitted disease and teen pregnancy are precisely those states that have the strictest prohibitions against sex ed in school. Yeah. So, I mean, we're choosing ignorance again and again and again, uh, despite the fact that it clearly doesn't work. So, you know, I sort of see that as a, as a microcosm of the larger issue. Civilization is not making people happier. It's not, you know, money. There's a big section in the book about money, which is, of course, seen as the sort of uh, the panacea in civilized societies. The more money you have, the better you're doing. You know, you're winning this game. But it turns out that wealthy people aren't happier than less wealthy people. Um, you know, there's a certainly being dirt poor is no fun. But once your basic needs are met, there's no correlation between more income and greater happiness. So my point is that I think civilization is basically a scam and we're all victims of it. And we're destroying the planet in the process of chasing after this illusion of greater happiness and greater life satisfaction through consumerism and, and um, the other dynamics of, of civilization. And I think that the more that we can disconnect uh, and design our lives with some intention and knowledge of the nature of, of our species, the better off we'll all be. Which, I mean, that's that's where the work ethic of the hunter-gatherer comes in, isn't it? Yeah, I, I was very young. I was probably, I don't know, in my early 20s when, I don't even remember who I was with, but somebody said to me, Chris, there are two currencies that you'll spend through your life. One is money and the other is time. You can always get more money, but you'll never get more time. And I never forgot that. Uh it's so true. You know, I, I'm 57 years old and I don't have a lot of money, uh, but I have no regrets because I've always done what I wanted to do. I've walked away from jobs offering me lots of money because I wasn't comfortable there because I didn't like the work I was doing because I wanted to travel. Um, I have no regrets. And I understand that other people are working with different financial pressures. I don't. I chose not to have children, for example, so that I wouldn't have to worry about taking care of someone else financially. Um, and I understand that other people have made other decisions and, and face other challenges. Um, but I think that no matter what your life path is, it's important to understand that you don't get to do this again. This isn't a practice run. Um, so... Life is not about happiness. I think life is about meaning. Uh, Viktor Frankl talked about that in, in Man's Search for Meaning, which is a fantastic book I recommend to everyone. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think that it's very important to 
understand that the value of life is in experiences, uh, not in possessions. And that is a, a very hunter-gatherer approach to things, which has certainly served me well. Mm. And then you mentioning Viktor Frankl leads me on to the questions that I ask everyone on this podcast, which is, uh, what is a book that you would recommend and a tip for living with more energy and vitality? Um, you've obviously mentioned Viktor Frankl and, and Ronald Rice already. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, I, it's it's hard to recommend one book to everyone. Uh, depends what people are into. Uh, you know, I certainly um, there's a beautiful book by Robert Sapolsky, who's um, a neuroscientist and a primatologist who teaches at Stanford. It's uh, it's called a Primate's Memoir. Uh, it's a beautiful book which is partly about this baboon troop that he's been studying for 30 some years now in Kenya, starting when he was, I think, an undergrad, um, and he continues to go there every year. And um, it, the chapters interspersed between talking about the baboon troop and, and his research um, with them, he's particularly interested in stress levels and how um, stress correlates to ranking in the hierarchy, because baboons are extremely hierarchical primates. Uh, and the book sort of jumps back and forth from the, the study of the baboons to trips that he took and experiences that he had in Africa over the years, hitchhiking to Uganda and the different uh, people, the Maasai that he was living with and working with. It's beautiful, fascinating book. He's a great writer. It's really fun to read, full of um, surprises and and uh, really rich color of, of his experiences. So I, I would recommend that to, to anybody. And as far yeah, as... really good. Yeah, he's a great writer. He yeah. also wrote a, bo a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which is um, about stress. So as I said, that's his his specialization. And, um, and what he finds with the, the baboons, by the way, is sort of correlates to, to what we were talking about. The baboons with the lowest stress levels, um, the males are the ones that are ranked in the middle, not the alpha males, right. not the highest ranking and not the lowest ranking. The lowest ranking get harassed constantly. And that's no fun. And the highest ranking are constantly fighting to maintain their position. Yeah. And that's no fun. So the if you know again, the, let's look at how do we measure a good life? Well, one of the measures is low stress level, right? Stress is no fun. So in this case, the baboons, the male baboons who have the best quality of life, if we're looking at stress, are not the leaders. They're not the ones on top. They're the ones in the middle who sort of stay out of everyone's way, live their lives, have a good time. Yeah. So again, you know, what ambition, what does it really get us? You know, where is it taking us? So following on from that, uh, as far as living one's life with more energy and vitality, I would say uh, do whatever you can to reduce stress. And that's kind of counterintuitive because – Certainly in the United States, everything's about work. You got to work out. You got to work on your marriage. You got to work. You got to, you know, get ahead. You got to, I mean, I was having lunch in a restaurant the other day and the, the waitress came over and asked me if I was still working on my salad. Like, no, I'm not working <laughs> on my salad. I'm yeah. trying to enjoy it. You know, so yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think less work, more play uh, is very important. Um, and, and just sort of expand out from that. So if you have, um, a choice of sleeping six hours and getting up and going to the gym versus sleeping eight hours and not going to the gym, I say sleep eight hours and the hell with the gym. It's probably better for your health in the long run. You're going to feel better. You're going to be, you know, sleep is very important. You can't, you know, I'll sleep when I die. Well, good luck. Cause it's coming sooner than you think, you know? So, yeah, I, I uh, am a big advocate of the sort of Spanish approach to life, you know, which is relax, take your time and enjoy it because a life that's being enjoyed is a life that's worth living and it's probably going to last longer. Mm.
and something that ties in with both your book recommendation and your uh, and your tip there. I uh, I was I went on a, a deer rutting safari this week, which is amazing. It's like kind of deer rutting season here, and you, you go and watch them. Uh, the males literally fight with each other uh, for possession of the females as they come into season, which is very short. It's only a couple of days. Um, and it was just the most magnificent kind of primal experience. But the the top stags, the ones that have caught the kind of, really it tends to be the, the physically biggest and the, the ones that have the, the biggest antlers, they really round up as many of the females as possible. And then for about two weeks, they don't sleep, they don't eat. All they do is try and keep the females in the corner of the field and they kind of make this kind of roaring sound to try and scare off all the other males. And then after the the act has happened and after they've actually mated, a lot of them just drop down dead because they're so knackered they haven't got enough to eat in winter. <laughs> <laughs> but but the middle ranking ones, especially the kind of adolescent ones who don't have such big big antlers, they're just uh, they they're just kind of in the corner just trying to pick off one or two females that he can't protect. So that very much ties in with the uh, with your attitude on uh, on both kind of being more primal and, and doing less. I think exactly exactly you know the more you have the more effort it takes to keep it and protect it and uh, keep people from stealing it whether whether it's female deer or you know money uh, there's a there's a happy middle I I talk about in in the book the example I use is red wine right like I lived in Spain for 20 years I like red wine um, but you can have really good wine for 15 bucks a bottle. I mean, that's great. That's fine. I've had, I've, you know, I can't imagine wine tasting better than some Riojas I've had that were in that price range. Mm. But people are spending $1,500 a bottle for wine. Is that wine 100 times better? No, of course it's not. Yeah. That's a scam. You're getting ripped off. Your, your ego is allowing, you know, a Rolex watch tells people you've got a problem a timex tells people tells you the time it's it's uh all this like chasing after status it's an empty game it's ne you're never going to win it's not going to lead you to happiness or meaning or anything that is actually of true value to a human being it's all a scam and uh yeah so you know oh you're the stag that's got 30 females in the corner of the field are you enjoying yourself are you having a good time or are you just sort of <laughs> blindly following some sort of biological imperative that you have you're not smart enough to to think your way out of yeah which I is exactly what that what the stags were doing it was just so just biological they couldn't see another way yeah yeah like you're you're a slave to your genetics um and one of the things that we have as human beings that's unique and truly amazing is the capacity to think our way out of these traps. So that's what I'm encouraging people to do. Really stop and take a look at what really makes you happy. F ignore the commercials for a while. Ignore the movie stars. I know movie stars. I live in L.A. And let me tell you, they're no happier than you are. They're probably less happy. Mm -hmm. Um Really think it through before uh, you commit, uh, before you get into debt and have to, you know, spend your life digging your way out. Because the things that really make you happy, they're not very expensive at all. Chris, thank you so much. Um, I would heartily recommend people check out your podcast, Tangentially Speaking, which I've been listening to for a long time. Um, and the book is Civilized to Death. And where can people find out more about you and, and all the different projects that you've got going on, which isn't that much apart from those two things because you've got the uh, work <laughs> ethic of a hunter-gatherer. <laughs> yeah, I have a good webpage, though. Uh, Thatchrisryan.com. The podcast is there. Uh yeah, book tour if, if people are in the U.S. I I don't have any uh, dates in the U.K. quite yet, but uh, I have some friends in the U.K. I'd love to come and see. Uh, you probably heard the episode I did with, um, who's the guy who did Try? Bruce Perry. Uh, he's in Wales. I want to go see him. Right, yeah. You ever I see that so. show? I, I, uh, I'm not sure, actually. Oh, it's a great show. It was on BBC for a while. Um, I think two or three seasons. His name's Bruce Perry. He was um, special forces um, in the UK. I taught survival skills. And then he um, 
he went out and he did this show where he would go and live with a hunter gatherer group for a month or two. And it was just him and his cameraman. And, uh, it's a beautiful show. He's, wow. he's a really interesting guy. It's, it's not macho, you know, let me go out and show these people. And it's, it's like just going there. He eats what they eat. He lives with them and participates in their ceremonies. And, um, he's a really good traveler because he, he, you know, he's not presumptuous. He's just trying, he's, he's laughing and smiling all the time. It's beautiful. Anyway, I did a podcast with him and we became friends and now he's in Wales and I'd love to go visit oh, him. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, definitely come over. Yeah. Um, Chris, good luck with the book. Thank you. And thanks uh, for having me on. Tony. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much for coming on. It's been great to talk to you. Well, that's it. Thanks to Chris. Thank you for listening to Zestology as well. And uh, yeah, remember his podcast is Tangentially Speaking. And if you'd like to get my Three Zesty Things newsletter, in which I've mentioned Chris a few times, you can head to TonyWrighton.com. It's TonyWrighton.com. Um, given away quite a lot on that newsletter recently, actually. All sorts of things. Um, and yeah, I've definitely mentioned Chris a few times on there as well. Uh, send out the old three zesty things lose zesty every Monday morning, and uh, yeah, you can get that then. So, TonyWrighton.com uh, for me, and tangentially speaking for Chris. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>